Hey, I'm Chris. This is Margie. We are here in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and we are here at the Firefighters Museum. So we're going to go in and take a look. So come on with us. Warm all right so we are inside and we are okay. in a room where they started and margie says she's warm all right so it looks like we got look at that old, that old fireman's helmet wow <clears throat> that one's old too look at that and we got says speaking trumpet inscription reads okay so we need to if we're going to do this while we do it we need to figure out this too all right, all right. So what does it say? Um, it's a scavenger hunt. All right. So why was the hand pumper called a squirrel tail? Why was the hand pumper called a squirrel tail? So we just look at to... all this amazing stuff. Yeah, this is... We'll do that, but we're also just everything. The original stations with horses. Oh, wow. Down here we have the Albert Hook and Ladder. Dress review in front of their station on Clinton Street. Some amazing stuff. Look at the speaking trumpet. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. And that one there. Awesome. All right, where are you going? Oh, I'm going right here. Oh, my word. What's wrong? This is, this is like. Uh, are we supposed trumpet. to go in here? It says right here. All right. Holy cannoli. Holy cannoli, she oh. says. Those are hoses above this hose this tower. Too. Is it pretty high? Oh, yeah. Let's look. Oh, wow. Wowie. Yeah, that's pretty high for me. So it says, the hose tower. The hose tower was used to dry hoses after a fire at the top of two racks, similar to one lying on the floor of the tower. The wet hose was drug into the bottom of the tower where firefighters would tie a rope around it. Another fire fighter would ascend the stairs. The hose would... The hose would then be pulled up the tower using a block of tackle set up. When the hose reached the top, it was placed over the rack and left to dry for about two weeks. Extra hose was kept in the firehouse to replace any hose that was drying. It goes all the way up. And like she said, it's really, really up there. Back in here. They got hoses over here on this rack. Let's see. They got the 1860s button side brake engine. All right. So, this looks like something that would have been pulled around with hoses on it. Look at this little thing. Miniature pumper built by P. Brady, the Fire Queen of 1868. P. Brady. And they got some stuff over here, all different kinds of, looks like different certificates. Oh, look at the badges. Edward Johnson badges. Ralph Allen Wood and Edward Johnson. Watch these hazards in spring cleaning. What's this? Fire station number three. A building that now houses the firefighter museum. So. So this used to be fire station number three, and they got all kinds of pictures with the horses, with trucks. So that was 1911, 1928. <clears throat> this one does not say, but it's got horses pulling the truck here. Interior of fire station three, which we're in right now, and 1893. 
All right, we're in the next room. And as you can see, they got some very antique looking fire engines in here. So I'll look at these little, little matchbox cars they got over here. A little model of a fire car, model of a 1928 uh, Harn Fox fire engine built by Fort Wayne firefighter Carl Utterback in 1997. Wow. But behind us, I don't know. I don't know if it's the same thing or not. There's a thing on the back about. But we got. Sorry. Over here we also have a hose thing. Also we got a buggy. It is the exact same thing. So there's pictures of the truck that we're standing behind right now. You can see where it's holding all the hoses in it. It's got the great big pipes on the side. Wow, look at the size of that hose. That's a big hose, Margie. Show them how big that hose is. Just put your hand out over it. Don't. Yeah, it's a big hose. I wonder if people rode on the back of it because there's only room for two people inside. That says this is the watch room. What's that say, Marge? It says this is the watch room for the station. This room was assigned to one firefighter each day. His job was to receive the alarms when they came in, count the rings of the gong, get the location of the alarm box, and relay the information to the other firefighters as they got the equipment ready to go out the door. This firefighter was the only one to sleep downstairs in case someone came to the door with an emergency overnight. He was also responsible for disconnecting the steam fire engine from the station boiler and hot tender placed into the steamer's firebox so the water could be heated up and route to the fire. Oh, wow. So here they actually have oh, sorry. some of these as well, different fire trucks. So I'm assuming that well, we can works. come into the watch. So I'm assuming that's the door they must have. Yes, yes. Look at that old telephone. Well, we got the front end of this truck. Look how big this pump is. At the very front of it. So you think they use this to pull the water through? So they got most of these, a lot of these, they got some of the little models. For these over there. Locations on alarm boxes in the 1900s. Oh wow. That's where all the alarm boxes were. We do have a. It says the 1927 Aharon Fox. It says the prestigious Iron Fox Company built this fire truck in Cincinnati, Ohio for Fort Wayne in 1927. Truck through the city of Fort Wayne from 1927 until 1964. The front mounted pump with the large silver pressure dome ball was the trademark for RN Fox. This company was known as the Cadillac of Fire Trucks and was the cutting edge of technology for the time. In older days, a separate piece of apparatus was needed to accomplish cash tap task on the fire scene. One apparatus to pump water, one apparatus to carry hose, and one apparatus to carry ladders. This truck combined them all into one multiple multi-rolled unit with firefighters riding the side steps and back steps It delivered personnel as well. Wow. So what do we have over here? The 1893 Omoskig steam fire engine built by Matt Manchester Locomotive Works in Manchester, New Mexico, New York, New, York, New Hampshire. I don't know. It looks like it has a <laughs> Hawaii and then an H. All right. Extra first class size double steam 1100 GPM pump has a crane neck frame. Serial so number 701. The size steamer weighs 9,000 pounds and needed three horses to pull it. 
purchased and used by the Detroit Fire Department in 1893, engine number nine, and used until 1930. It was then sent to Greenfield Village and Reform Museum, where it sat in storage until the early 1980s when the Fort Wayne Fighters Fire Firefighters Museum purchased it. So, wow. Pretty big, huh? And then over here we got this. What we got here, Marge? Replica of Chief's buggy used during the turn of the century, 1893. That's pretty neat. So that'd be the fire chief's buggy. 42, I think. So 1942. We'll find out up here. They'll have three on them because that's the station number, right? That's what I would say. I would assume. Oh, here's the sign. All right. The 1942 International. From 1938 to 1942, the Fort Wayne Fire Department did something not many other departments in the country can say. It built its own fire trucks. Is that it? This truck's a 1942 International was one of the 12 fire trucks known as the Home Built Fleet. The fire department purchased all the parts needed, stored those parts throughout the city at various fire stations, and the mechanics at the field fire shop built these unique fire trucks. <coughs> so that's kind of cool. And then over here we have another. This is 1938 International. You want to read that one too, Margie? Fort. By 1938, Fort Wayne's. Ten pumpers had an average of 18 years, some were nearly worn out. The newest was a 1927 Aaron's Box model PS-4 piston pumper. Next in age were six American La France pumpers that had been delivered in 1920. The aging fleet was a problem, but where would the money for replacements come from? The efforts from the Great Depression were still being felt, and Fort Wayne was a conservative city with a large German population not known for freely spending money. Here we go. The polio. So the polio virus also called infantile paralysis. Infection viral disease. It reached epidemic of four kids in the nineteen forties and fifties. What's it say? Um, I read the first one so far. Like yeah. the first paragraph. The polio virus is called infantile paralysis is an acute infectious viral disease that reached epidemic um, proportions in the 1940s and 50s. In 1950, there were 33,344 cases in the United States. The virus is believed to enter the body through the mouth, multiplying the throat and then into the intestines. The iron, let's see. There's what pictures of iron lines up here. Of those severely affected, many suffered from paralysis of the muscles used in breathing. These people had to struggle to take in enough air, had to rely on mechanical aid to survive. This large metal tank that enclosed all of the patient's body except the head was known as the iron lung. The iron lung suffers, the one on display here, had a diaphragm that moved in an up and down motion. Sorry, I'm having a hard time reading it. As the diaphragm moves upwards, the space occupied by the air and the tank is reduced, increasing the pressure inside. Here we go into the alarm room. That's a different looking fire alarm. Isn't there? There's so many different ones, though. Oh, yeah. You know what this reminds me of looking at all these? Mm -mm. The t TV museum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look at all these. Motorola. Wow. Been around for a long time, haven't they? Mm -hmm. General Electric. Oh, wow. So this right here? Yeah. Um, Samuel Bass, I think it's Bass Homestead. Um, 27... 2700 to 2800 Bass Road, destroyed by fire in 1902, now the site of St. Francis University. Oh, wow. Yep. 
The help is needed to this includes a box and waits for the fire department to arrive to tell them where they are located. What does this say? What is this that's in the wall behind you? This, um, the fire alarm system. When box is pulled, the signal is when the box is pulled, the signal goes to the dispatch center and received by the dispatcher. So this is one here. Yeah. And then that happens two. That goes two. Over here is three. The box number is then set up in the sending unit and retransmitted to the firehouses. And it goes four, which goes to the bell. Which box number is received by the gong and the joker system in the firehouse. The number rings by the gong and is recorded by the joker. All right, so the box number is looked up in the card drawer and the location and who responds is known. Okay. All right. It's a lot of... Yeah, just... Oh, wow, that. look at all those right there, though. That's how they fail. What's that? The fire alarm boxes. Oh, that was out. That was what was out there on yeah, the wall. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, that's amazing. That oh yeah. All of that and that go together. Right. What from that? That's crazy. All right. No, look at this. That's what's up there. Oh my word. Yeah. That's a lot. So this is just a bigger system. Is that what this, that? It looks like it, but that just like looks too much for me. That oh, gives yeah. me a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> Like, I would not even it's know where probably, to begin. It's probably simpler than what you think it is, too. You're like, I don't know which one to put. Oh, look at this one. I don't know what this is. It says, uh, control panel from watch room at station one. They're just little switches. Oh, these are police call boxes. Oh, police call boxes. Uh -huh. So, look. Oh, they were active. Do you I think it does anything were... if I flip the switch? I wouldn't flip this. I'd love to touch anything. Well, this says it was active until 1965. All right. That's like like five years before you were born. That thing was still with you. <laughs> wow, what's this? Repeater system. Eight circuit repeater system used to amplify the signal of the alarm box. As the city grew larger and the boxes were spread over a larger distance, used until 1922 when the slate board and the dispatch center were installed. All right, I did not know we had another area. <clears throat> oh, wow. Steel dynamic room. It's the Earl Bus Steel Dynamic Room. We got a lot of stuff in here. Look at the different pictures of the different fire trucks, Marge. A lot of fire trucks here. It's much cooler in this room, too. <laughs> this one looks weird. Marge, look. There's the squirrel tail. <laughs> and look at this. 1955 American LaFrance engine it's a convertible it's a big fire engine this is the rescue boat yeah look at that golf cart or golf cart go kart i said golf cart i don't think they use this for firefighting at all so who manufactured the rescue boat? So we need to read about the rescue right. boat. Oh, well, we haven't even looked at the rescue boat, Marty. We're already, you're ahead. It's behind Here me. we go. We have the Fort Wayne Fire Department rescue boat. And the first question on there was what? Who manufactured the boat? Who manufactured the boat? There's, I don't see anything. I'm assuming not right there. Uh, presented by Hydrodyne. I don't see any, there's like no paper for oh, it. Oh, did no. we look all the way around? Is there something in here to read that maybe we've missed? All right, now I'm going to go with Hydrodyne. Pictures of the boat. A.B. Crosby, owner of Midwest Industries, donated and custom made boats to Fort Wayne. Is that who made it? Huh? What? Is that who made it here? Who? 
over here. Okay, hang on just a second. <clears throat> All right, who was it manufactured by? It says A.B. Crosby, owner of Midwestern Industries, donated and custom-made boats to the Fort Wayne Fire Department. 226, 1964. Oh, it said Midwestern Industries? Would you say? <clears throat> All right. What we got in this room, Margie? Bunch of stuff. Displays and pictures. Displays and pictures. Look at that old fireman's cap, captain's badges. like a map of Fort Wayne <coughs> protecting the fort, the growing city, and the department that protects it. There's an old Fort Wayne firefighter's glasses, helmet. Look at them lanterns. Those buckets, fire buckets. Oh wow, we got a whole another room to go into. We have Three or four rooms. Really? G. Wilson. First female Fort Wayne Fire Department. Firefighter, sorry. Janois Wills. Wilson. First paid fire chief, Henry Hilbrecht. First African American Fort Wayne firefighter. And then see where his name was. R.J. Ridley. So he expected to name first black fire department is R.J. Ridley. Clarence Grush, Fort Wayne fighter. So this is a. Uh, Looks like his uniform. Got different kinds of helmets here. Look at these helmets, Margie. Captain Chief helmets. Just the different firefighter helmets. One over here. We've got fireman badges. Certificate of appointment of Melvin Coher. Funeral services from Michael Rager. Died in the line of duty of March 22, 1972. Written on the back of a helmet in memory of Uncle Mike, who died wearing this helmet in a fire in Merrick Maysville Road, March 1972. In the light of duty, greater love has no one than this that lays down his life for his friends. Funeral service for Joseph Bollinger died in the line of duty November 3rd, 1924. And on down. Frederick William Hillsman. There is but one step between me and death. First Samuel 23. Basically, those who gave their life. Up above, we have a fire alarm. We have the uh, light and siren bar. Looks like some old extinguishers. So here we have the modern firefighter turnout gear, PBI structural. Firefighting gear was first issued in 1995 to the Fort Wayne Fire Department and is used today as the standard issue turnout gear. So what? So what were the questions? So who was the first African American firefighter in Fort Wayne and what year was he appointed? Okay. So what year? I guess it wouldn't matter. So it is 1961. Yeah. Boom. All right. 
They do um, have some pictures of the fire department in the middle. It fire? looks like this is where they kept their gear at. So they probably each had one of these that mm -hmm. had all their gear into it. And this is what they come to because we're upstairs. So we actually would be in the quarters. Yeah, that one in there they have bones. Okay. So they have bones in that right. Uh -uh. Oh, wow. Look at all the different fire patches. Halifax Fire Rescue. There's a lot of patches from different places, aren't they, Margie? Yeah. It looks like they're from like maybe just different fire departments over the... That's what it is. Um, but country. I've seen... It looked like there was some, yeah, from different countries. Yeah. Here's, well, here's one. These are from different countries. Mexico. Yeah. And these are from different parts of the United States, it looks like. So this is Go ahead and read that. So the fire station bedrooms. The station bedrooms have not really changed much over the years, with the exception of the dividers between the beds. The dividers were put in during that time women were being hired. The only thing the city supplies are the beds. Each firefighter has to have his own bedding, which is kept in their lockers until their shift. In the morning, the off-going shift removes their bedding, and the new crew puts theirs down. The practice of keeping the night hitch next to the bed at the night ended in the late 1990s when it was found that chemicals from the fires were absorbed into the pants and off-gassed into the bedroom, creating a harmful environment for the crew. This is the fire pool. So this is where all the firemen would go down. And if you're looking at it going, well, that ain't a fire pool because you can't see. But if you go around, oh, yes, they have a little... Can. Margie will get out of my way for a second. They have the little slit in there. You can see it goes all the way down below us. So it looks like it's the Fort Wayne Fire Department Water Rescue Team. Oh, wow. It says the Water Rescue Team is a voluntary group of firefighters who are specially trained as scuba divers. They handle all water rescue and recovery responses. They are spread out among the 18 fire stations in Fort Wayne and respond when needed. Here's the suit they wear. So this is the hazmat team's part. The Fort Wayne Fire Department hazardous materials response team. The hazmat team is a voluntary group of firefighters who are specially trained as hazmat technicians. They handle all serious hazardous material responses. They are spread out among the 18 fire stations in Fort Wayne and respond as needed. Wow. This is the Fort Wayne Fire Department special operations response team. Want to read that one, Margie? Which one? Um, the SWORT team is a voluntary group of firefighters who are specially trained in combined space rescue, trench rescue, high and low angle rope rescue, and building collapse rescue. They handle all special operation responses, and they are also spread out among the 18 fire stations in Fort Wayne. So this is, this right here, is used for repelling or climbing. And I wore one of these in Vermont when I went through mountain training school and uh, repelled off the side of a mountain. Here we have Jaws of Life. The Hearst Rescue Tool hoses for... Hearst spreading. Rescue Tool pushing rams and rams extensions. Hearst Rescue Tool cutters. Hearst Rescue Tool pushing rams and rams extensions. The Hearst Rescue Tool Power Unit and the Hearst Rescue Tool Spreader. So, what is the question on there, Marge? What is the name of the Hearst Rescue Tool? What is it? It's it's the Jaws of Life. Yes. And is that it? That is it. And I believe we've seen almost everything in here, haven't we? All right, so that's gonna do it. Thank you guys for joining us as we went through the Firefighters Museum here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I hope to catch you all in the next adventure. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.